Good day and welcome back to Elementary 72 Gaming. I'm back again with another Tower of God breakdown of the first season. So moving up from where we were in the last um, episode, I said that they got through the test. I explained how their test was working and what it was testing. Now moving forward, the next thing that we have is the crown game. The crown game is actually devised in multiple parts. It's a test that is being done by the supervisor. He has a hidden objective, which you will find out about uh, later near the end of this chapter we already know that Rachel is on this floor she is also part of this test and Balm is part of this test this is information that you can get if you've read that chapter obviously if you are going through this it's just a basic recap there's so much more even though I'm spoiling a lot of the story points I'm, I'm missing like 100 mini little pieces that you would want to know you want to know who the other characters are you want to know um a lot of other things. So this game is explained with basic rules. There is a throne in the center of the room and on it is a crown. A maximum of five teams can participate per round and there are a total of five rounds that will last 10 minutes apiece. So if you go in in the start you have to last for 50 minutes and if you go in in the last round if you manage to get the throne you only have to last for 10 minutes. But there's a lot of complexity with this entire situation. If you jump into this test uh, haphazardly with the full round of players, you're all going to fight each other to get the crown. Whoever sits on the throne with the crown wins that round immediately if there is nobody on the throne. And if there is someone on the throne, when you dethrone them, the moment you take the throne and sit on the throne, you immediately knock out everybody else from that round and the round ends. So that's the way to finish the round quickly if you are capable of doing it within the rules of their game. So the reward for this test, uh, which is an optional test for them, is progressing to the next floor instantly. Now the girl with the green April jumps in in the first match and another team who are using divination as their skill to pass the test also jumps in. These two jump in for the first round and the girl with the green April, her name is Anak Jahad. So what she does right off the back is she goes and she swings a weapon directly at them and smacks them all over the place. And that is how this part of the story goes. This is everything you need to know about Tower of God all the way to this basic start point. And once you've seen this here, then you obviously know that more is coming afterwards. I just want to take a deep breath and hit this in. So she goes and she takes out this entire team all on her own. And she sits in the chair. Now, when she sits in the chair, Aguero Agnes has this epiphany in his head that something isn't right with what's going on. I'm just removing that background because... It's a bit of a blur and I prefer this background. So Aguero Agnes figures out that something isn't quite right about this um, strategy that she's playing. She jumped in and she's sitting on there when she's so powerful. The weakest member of the team is the best idea for the throne because it makes it almost impossible for you to lose. So in the second round, two teams join to take on the team with the throne. And what happens is... They both fight on separate fronts to try and take out the members of this team. Now, this team is made up of Shibisu, the genius who passed uh, the door test perfectly. Uh, Anak, who is a beast with a 13-month weapon, which is unbelievably powerful. And last but not least is a swordsman named Hats. He uses two swords with a special skill called the highest flying sword and the lowest flying sword. So the lowest flying sword is actually a ground-based assault sword that he can throw or directly slice you with. And the highest flying sword is a sword that he pulls with Shinsu that can hit you from the air when you try to attack him in his blind spots. And that's how he uses his two swords. Ooh. Okay, so at this point, the game now heats up and these two teams jump in and they start fighting. Hats instantly dominates the three members who are fighting him. They fight him all together, all out, and they lose. On the other side, Shibisu is facing quite a weak set. He's facing Miss Lennon, Ho, 
who is another member who is quite weak. And then is another member of the Ten Great Families, Laure Pansquo of or Eurasia or Eurasia, whatever they want to call the name. But nonetheless, I, I call them the Pansquo family. And I don't know if it's uh, any other way to say it. There, might, there most probably is a better pronunciation of that name. But nonetheless, he is on that team. Now, as I said, Ten Great Families is part of the lineage of those who first conquered the tower. They are really powerful individuals. So he had a strategy to take it, distract the members of their team and have them pull away from the defense of the center point because he is what you'd call a wave controller, one of the positions of the tower. Basically, they control the Shinsu and they can control the form of energy that it takes. So they concentrate it into what's called a bang and they increase its tension and strength, which is called Su and Yun. And this allows them to fire off attacks inside the tower and that gives them their damage capability. So they, Lauro, uh, Lauro, Lauro leads an attack against Anak and then Anak ignites a green April. Now the green April is a crazy weapon when it ignites, it breaks into pieces and assaults wherever it wants. Uh, rumor has it it can fill an entire floor with a forest when ignited with the true poten potential of someone powerful. So, yeah, that's how big it is. Okay. At this point, everybody is deterred from taking part in the fight. But this is actually bait to pull out the princess of Jahad who joined into this test. That's uh, the one who is with Rachel. Rachel's test actually had three survivors. The weapon that uh, Hiron gave to Rachel, Rachel herself, and the princess of Jahad and the Rossi. And this test, th this whole thing with the Green April was meant to fish out the princess of Jahad so that uh, Anak could get a chance to kill her. There was the whole idea. So moving on from this here, uh, when, when two 13 month weapons are close together and are ignited, they start to resonate with each other. And obviously the Green April just ignited, so it starts to resonate with the Black March. And Anak feels this presence while she's in the middle of the fight and dominating everything. And she heads towards it instantly to go and pick it up because she wants to collect the weapon so she can get her revenge. She has a long story. I'll get into that at another time. Okay, at this point, uh, she's left the seat. She's disqualified and she's threatening to kill Bam. The administrator, Lara Road, jumps in and he says, that's enough from you. Get back to your room. Um, disqualified people have no right to fight and there's no fighting during the breaks. And she says quite easily, the moment they pass this floor, she's going to kill Bam the next opportunity she gets, just so that she can take that weapon. So she makes an opportunity for Bam to keep the weapon in the form of a bet. And the bet is pretty simple. If uh, they win the game in the remaining three rounds that remain, Bam gets the Green April and the Black March and he's safe, she won't attack him. But if he loses, he loses the Black March to the to um, Anak and he gives up the sword that uh, lent him power. Now, Bam is a very straightforward and very um, good guy, just to say the very least about his personality. So he can't betray someone who's helped him. And since the sword has helped him before or the needle, he can't give it away. He can't just surrender it like this. He will fight for it. And he takes up the challenge and they go through the next round. Now, something to note is Aguero Agnes had collected three regulars in his bag before he met Bam. And he used them in this test because they technically passed all three tests with Aguero because he went through them all the way till that point. He drops them out to help him in the crown game. And these three members basically are considered a team. They passed both tests perfectly. And 
now they're at the stage where they're taking part in the bonus game. So Aguero told them exactly what he can, what he will do to trigger the significance of them jumping in and helping him. So we'll just tie a ribbon up with his hair and his hairstyle will change. That means they are to jump in and assist. At this point, things go exactly the way that they want. They win the first round when they first jump in. I, I forgot to mention that. They get uh, Bomb to sit on the, the chair. We introduce the fact that Kun has some very rare weapons on his side. The compression bag, Marin, Marin Bar and Dina, which can also copy items and defend against heavy assaults. It's a very powerful item. The next thing that uh, we get introduced to is is Suspendium uh, Pulley, which is something else. I'll explain that later. So we introduced to these items that uh, Kun uh, Aguero Agnes has on himself. And we find out that he's now made it to the final round. In the final round, they have a full uh, swarm of teams. All five enter. And when they all enter, all of a sudden, chaos breaks out. They don't have much of an option. They have to fight. And none of the attacking teams can bypass the defending team or allow any other attacking team to defeat the defending team because that means they'll win the game instantly by sitting on the crown uh, uh, on the throne, taking over the crown and having control. So all they had to do was hold on for 10 minutes and they win the game. So as Baum is sitting on the chair, he is approached by Rachel and Ghost. And when he sees Rachel, he's a bit confused because of Ghost's presence. He knows that Rachel wouldn't team up with a monster. They're not a good matchup. At this point, um, another member of the regulars attacks uh, Rachel. And as she's attacking Rachel, she is about to kill Rachel when Bam jumps in and he uses Shinsu. Now, now we get into the important part of this chapter of this whole chess series. So what came after the crown game is going to be your position placing. Now, Bam jumped in to save... Um, Rachel from being killed by this regular who attacked her and in the process he actually slit her eye open with Shinsu. Now as I said Shinsu is capable of taking on any form within the tower. So anyway at this point we then get a little bit of um, backstory on what's going on in this entire situation. Sorry about that. We get told about the various positions within the tower. So we are told th this is after this test is over. I'm, I'm not even going to go into details about what happens there. You have to read it to get the idea behind it. So they move on to the next set of tests. The next set of tests is called position testing. Now position testing is quite simple. They train in a position that is required for a team so that they can progress to complete the final mission of the floor and climb up to the next level. Now, the, mission, the objective that is given to, um, to them is to learn how to play these positions. The positions are fishermen. Fishermen is someone who sits at the helm of battle. They fight in the front line. They are extremely strong and extremely capable of close range and uh, fast combat. Then the next position to note is the scout. The scout will go ahead of the fisherman, look through the dark places of the tower and give bearings to his team. Thereafter, they will engage dangerous enemies. The next position is going to be the light bearer. The light bearer is the nervous system of the team. They take in all the information from the scouts observers, which is a tool, and they put it through their data processing computer called the Lighthouse to give them a set of actions to complete moving forward. Now, with this entire relay, it's just part of the, the way that it works. Um, so the team members can interlock in different formations. I'll explain that at a later point in the story. 
The next position that is of relevance is the wave controller. Wave controllers dominate the flow of Shinsu. They can help assist the fishermen and scouts in battle. They can also help mobilize uh, movements for the front lines of combat. And that makes them very useful for many tricks in terms of actual combat against rankers. Uh, sorry, when they are ranker, uh, when they are ranker um, wave controllers. Following this is one more position called the spear bearer. I think I missed something on the wave controller. The wave controller uses Shinsu in such a way that he will directly assault the enemy or debuff the enemy or buff his own team with his Shinsu. And he can do this in conjunction with other members of his team or totally on his own. Some wave controllers are more dangerous than fishermen. Some fishermen are more dangerous than wave controllers. It's just the way that it works. <clears throat> and the spear bearer works best with the lighthouse. He listens to what the observer tells him and what the lighthouse communicates. And he follows the orders to the T. He'll get the straight bearings right to the millisecond if possible. And that is how they work in a team. Now, they give them a certain number of players who are available for each position, and that leads them to the second test of the floor called the hide-and-seek test. I will be getting into that in the next video. Catch you all then. Have a good day.